Um, so we're moving on. So the, the next talk is by Lauren McIntyre from University of Florida. Good afternoon. Um, thank you all for coming to this talk. Um, I know many people um, here from Drosophila uh, communities, but um, I am going to talk to you today about maize um, and really more broadly about uh, systems genetics. Okay. Um, I am a, a very collaborative scientist, and I work together with a lot of, um, a lot of people. And I want to say right up front that uh, really the work that I do is very integrated with the work of a lot of other people. Um, this is just a small set of some of the people I work with um, on a regular basis. And then the other thing is, um, just for history's sake, um, a lot of the things that I, uh, that I think about the, are built on uh, work from, from Sewell Wright from a long time ago. Okay, and I'll try to acknowledge specific people as we go, go forward. Okay, I'm really very uh, goal-oriented. And, and, and also uh, like to kind of think about uh, where am I going and what am I, what am I trying to do? And so what is the big goal of, of, of my research? I really want to understand how the, the genome of an organism is translated into its phenotype. And I know that for many of the people in this room, that, that's, that's, that's the goal, right? That, that's like the holy grail. So we think about the DNA, but more specifically, I want to understand how does the DNA work? It, what happens next? How is that DNA making transcripts? Make, how are those transcripts interacting with chemicals and metabolites? And then miraculously, how do you get some phenotype? And this is a general question, and fruit flies are one of the organisms that I'm very, very interested in, and, and many of you may know some of the, the work that I do with fruit flies, but um, I'm also interested in things like uh, pathogenesis with, uh, this is a, a bone and joint infection from uh, Staph aureus. And then today, I'm going to talk to you about really one of the world's uh, most amazing plants, uh, sea maize. The question is the same, regardless of what organism that you're, uh, that you're working with. And so the question then really is, how do we do this? And there are a lot of, I mean, this is something that I think we're all thinking about, we're all talking about. And one of the things uh, we heard from the previous speaker about these great projects, GTEC, uh, you know, um, ENCODE, all this data coming at us. Um, and so once we achieve this goal with all of these great data sets, what can we do? Well, we can make personalized medicine. We can have designer crops. And maybe, for most of us in the room, we have some knowledges about some of the mysteries of life. But what about all this data? You know, all these data are descending upon us. And sometimes it just feels like uh, trash, just hitting us. Well, you can sort trash. Not everything in there is, is, in fact, something that is useless. Um, and you can even make useful things out of trash. And here's a Smithsonian article um, that talks about uh, Laura Kuttner, who was a Peace Corps volunteer who went and, to Indonesia and sorted through trash and made buildings out of soda cans. Um, and here's a South Korean artist who's built a building out of, uh, out of things. So this is not... I'm not, I'm not attempting to say to you that all of the big data sets that we collect are useless, okay? But I am saying that it's, it's difficult to think about how to sort through that information and make sense of it and use it in a way that gives us, um, gives purpose and structure and that it takes a fair amount of creativity to do that. Um, and another challenge of this is this is uh, the the keg, you guys know, kind of seen this up here. So these are based on sort of chemical reactions and biosynthetic pathways. 
Um, here's a schematic of how transcription works, and you'll know, notice that these are all, all proteins and there's not a lot of chemicals in here. So somehow we have to kind of bring together these world views of chemical reactions um, and then also sort of DNA synthesis and, pro and, and transcripts. And in some limited biochemical pathways, we have some view about how enzymes catalyze reactions and what comes in and what comes out. But those, um, those are really limited examples. And in general, we just don't know how metabolites and transcripts and proteins are connected to each other. Um, and, and how those might actually be connected to something like courtship is, a, is another big problem. So I think the big question is how do we integrate our knowledge with all of the data to accomplish our goal? Okay, we're all geneticists. This is how we do it, right? We use genetics. We use we use genetic variation and populations in order to help us answer these questions and put the pieces of the puzzle together. I think we all in this room particularly know one of anything, even if we mutate it, doesn't tell us all that much. You know, we're not gonna be able to connect an entire transcriptome to a metabolome to a phenotype if we have one phenotype and 10,000 transcripts. We need genetic variation. Um, luckily, we've realized this is a field, and this is really exciting. People like Trudy McKay, um, as pioneers, you know, putting together the, the um, Drosophila resource panel. And young faculty together with, uh, like Libby King, uh, working with Stuart uh, McDaniel and Tony Long, creating these, um, recombinant inbred lines and then sharing the data with all of us. And it's happened in Arabidopsis um, and mice. Um, and then this is the corn population, the nested association mapping population that Ed Buckler, um, Jim Holland, and Mike McMullen worked on. So these are great and these are resources and this, this is systems genetics. This is how we connect the dots. This is one way of doing it, whereas you create these recombinant inbred panels, but there's other ways of thinking about this using diversity panels. And there is a diversity panel in maize, there's a, Andy Clark has done a wonderful job with a diversity panel in Drosophila, and there's a diversity panel in sorghum. So we're thinking about how do we construct populations that we can then genotype and then phenotype on multiple levels and then use the power of genetics to help us integrate the information and use the, the genetic variation in order to help us connect the dots. Okay, so um, we can use genetic diversity to build gene networks. Um, I refer you to a poster by a former graduate student to talk about the gene network component. And I think importantly, we're learning more and more that we can predict um, the phenotypes. And I wanna show you here, this is one phenotype, which is the diversity of um, uh, ears and corn from the founders of the nested association mapping, mapping population in maize. And this is a photo from Sherry Flint Garcia. And I'm gonna take a little bit of time to say, we can only do this if we really do a good job on our experimental design. That's one of the things that, particularly in short talks like this, we hardly ever talk about, so I'm gonna talk about this. Um, when you do these big populations, you, you don't do them all in an hour. I mean, and I think most of the people in this room know this, and so you have some variation. Okay, and I also wanna say that we, we've been dancing around this uh, for the whole meeting. There, we have two goals. We really wanna understand What's the genetic architecture of this trait? How much variation is there going on? You know, is it additive? Is it dominant? Is it epistatic? Like, what, what's happening? Is there one gene? Are there many genes? Are there genes of, of large effect? Are there lots of little genes? And the other thing is we want to know where they are. We want to map. Um, and so as a thought exercise, a number of years ago, we kind of looked at these competing goals. And this is the conundrum that has faced population geneticists for, for a long time, basically, as long as we have been thinking about this, and that is in order to understand what the genetic architecture is, you need more alleles, 
And in order to understand, uh, to map, you need more segregants. So given that your experiment can only ever be um, as big as you can make it without actually uh, causing your graduate students to revolt, you need to kind of trade these things off. You need to kind of think about these two goals together. Okay, so now the maze project. Um, this is happening uh, basically in the real world, which means in a cornfield out in Illinois. Um, the project is led by Lisa Ainsworth at the University of Illinois, and Pat Brown, Andrew Leakey, and, and myself are all co-PIs. And so we wanted to kind of think about these goals together. And so here's our kind of basic experimental design. In 2013, when we first did this experiment, we had 50 classical phenotypes and 200 inbreds, so more alleles. Then we wanted to look at what kinds of things were different in the ozone condition versus the regular condition. And then in 2014, we did 50 inbreds, 2015 fewer inbreds, more replications. Um, and now in 2016, we're going to do a combination of both mapping in one part of the field and then a dialel, which we heard about from Will Valdar in the other part of the field. This is what the field kind of looks like if you make a map. Um, and then we have ring pairs of ozone and ambient. This is what the field looks like. It's huge. So there's a lot of variation here across this whole field. So um, this is something to keep in mind. That's, that's one plot. That's an aerial view of one plot. And those green, um, the green piping around it is how we distribute ozone. Uh, the ozone gets blown in depending on where the wind is blowing. And when we look at where the distribution is, um, since we have a prevailing wind from the southwest, we also have increased ozone exposure in the southwest corner of this field. So we planted um, B73, which is a kind of common maize genotype, all over the field in this pattern. So this is a heat map of where the B73 is. Um, just to get an idea of what the kind of um, environmental variation would be and use, be able to use that to kind of correct for things. And what we can see when we kind of project the B73 onto one of the experimental plots is that in these two regions, we actually have an increased response, say, for chlorophyll due to that southwest corner. So if we think about that southwest corner, we really want to be able to take that into account. And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually use a variance-covariance matrix that reflects where physically inbreds um, or hybrids are in the field. And so we have a trait-level model where that variance-covariance matrix actually reflects the spatial variation in the field. And then we use that to look for the effect of ozone. So when we look at individual traits, what we find consistently across the years is that there are some developmental traits that are different for ozone and some physiological traits that are different for ozone. And here's the point where I tell you that there is an army of undergraduates, graduate students, and postdocs who do all of these measurements. And that it really is a, just a huge number of people. So. The holy grail of, of, of this kind of thing is something called yield. It's like the trait, right? We want to be able to predict the yield. We want to know what affects the yield. Yield is one of these horrible traits in some sense because we have lots and lots of genes contributing to the yield. And so when we look at the ozone response, we have to think about, okay, well, how is that? So here's where the system comes in. We want to basically be able to model yield. We don't actually measure the same plants. It's in a way, it's like mice. You know, you might measure some mice for, for, for one trait and other mice for another trait. They're all the same genotype, but they're not actually the same plants. And sometimes not even the same plot. Um, so here, what you have to think about is that your experimental unit as the number of genotypes is quite important. If we use a simple model, we can actually show that ozone matters on the yield, but so does chlorophyll ear height, and specific leaf area. What's really fun about this is that once we account for chlorophyll, ear height, specific leaf area, the effect of ozone actually goes away. So what that means is that we can actually capture these effects with that. And that tells us that when we move on to our analysis of metabolites in RNA-seq, 
we can focus on things like photosynthesis in order to understand that middle process. Okay, so now I'm just going to finish by saying, again, this is a big project with a lot of people involved, and we're looking forward to focusing on this photosynthesis in our RNA-seq and metabolites and to our mapping and dialyl experiments to understand um, these better. Thank you.